Tonight, morning in Manitoba, seeking comfort in Sunday services. The crushing questions. Why me? Why this? Why now? Why them? After that fiery crash claimed 15 lives and forever changed so many others. It was the first time that she went out to this kind of an event and unfortunately not coming back. A risky return home in Quebec. But as soon as the weather changes, it's just gonna stand right back up. We know it's coming. The tight timeline evacuees could face. Plus, America's attempt at a diplomatic reset. The American public uh, see China now as a, as a threat. The high stakes sit down for two superpowers and what it means for Canada. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Reporting tonight, Morella Fernandez. Good evening. In Dauphin, Manitoba, it wasn't about trying to find answers today, but trying to find even a moment of peace. Residents of the small city gathered to pray for family and friends they lost in Thursday's bus crash and for each other crushed by that immense grief. CTV's Vanessa Lee is in Manitoba tonight. At a time when little can be done to ease the sorrow, people in Dauphin are turning to faith for comfort. At St. George's Ukrainian Orthodox Church this morning, a noticeable void. Have you lost parishioners? Yes. Yes. We will be having funerals. That must be extremely, extremely difficult. It is, because you have been with these people. You have laughed with them. You have cried with them. You have visited them in their homes. Victor Belinsky's cousin was among the seniors aboard the bus. She was 88. It was the first time that she went out to this kind of an event, you know, I guess with friends and family or whatever. And unfortunately, not coming back. Across this tight-knit community, prayers for those who died and for friends fighting to recover from devastating injuries. It's hard to accept. You know, just can't believe it. They're holding on to memories of happier times, seeing each other at dances, fall suppers, and even just out and about at the store. And now they're not going to be there anymore. You know, it, it is so sad because that generation is the knowledgeable generation that is. And they had an example for all of the younger generations. And now they're gone. Let's pray for all. Gone, but not forgotten. A community shouldering each other's pain, turning heartbreak into healing. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Dauphin, Manitoba. The prayers of some Quebec residents have been answered tonight. An evacuation order has been lifted, allowing them to go home. But the wildfire that chased them out now more than two weeks ago is still burning, and that means they may have to once again pack up and go. Here's CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief, Jean-Vierre Beauchemin. The latest forecast in Quebec is fueling fears a massive fire looming at the doorstep of Le Bel sur quivillon in the Abitibi region could get worse in days to come. A cool, rainy stretch of weather in much of the province is making way to dry, hot days this week ideal for extreme fire conditions and, depending on winds, for smoke smog to once again fill the air in cities south of the region. But help has arrived. Crews from the U.S. rolled in to Le Bel sur quivillon this week. As we talk, it's more fire than, than can be suppressed. The fire they're dealing with has already burned 378,000 hectares. They're now on the front line alongside Quebec squad, but also teams from Portugal. 200 firefighters speaking three languages joining forces. We're working on those fires with uh, 20 people uh, for the first week and a half. So we are, first of all, really happy to have some support, uh, some management uh, support like uh, Carl Steen. And they've drafted a plan to combat a potential escalating threat. You can look at some stuff now and think, oh, it's out. But as soon as the weather changes, it's just going to stand right back up. Yeah. So we know it's coming. And so we're, we're being thorough and, and making sure we're not stretching ourselves out too far. 
And while it was a ghost town for two weeks, some residents are back home tonight in Le Bel sur Quévillon. The evacuation order was lifted as Mayor Guy Lafrenière had planned. But after a briefing last night from officials, he warned residents to be ready to flee again at a moment's notice. Vous devez être prêt à évacuer à nouveau. And he asked those able to stay elsewhere not to return quite yet. The Quebec government is expanding its orders, restricting access to some force. Any spark could spark more trouble. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Now in B.C., the Donny Creek wildfire reached a troublesome milestone. It is now the largest fire ever recorded in the province's history. The fire, which is still out of control, has burned an estimated 534,000 hectares since May. That's nearly the size of Prince Edward Island. There are 79 fires currently burning across the province, and about a third of those are out of control. In the northern part of the province, an evacuation order has been lifted, allowing people in the Peace River region to return home tonight. Something that hundreds in neighboring Alberta have been waiting to hear for nearly three weeks. The fire in Fort Chippewan that forced them to leave their homes is still out of control. But as CTV's Miriam Valdez Carletti reports, the weather this week holds promise. Heavy rainfall in the province helped stabilize many wildfires, giving much needed time for crews to work ahead in Fort Chippewan. They've been able to really strengthen the south perimeter, which is um, the line of the fire that's closest to the communities. So it's uh, good news. A positive sign for the hundreds of people waiting for clearance to return home. The Athabasca Tribal Council says there's no firm date for re-entry, but it is already planning. We are looking forward to to host a telephone town hall prior to re-entry to ensure that everyone has the same information about the re-entry process. Alberta Wildfire says the fire in Fort Chippewan has grown to over 60,000 hectares and is still out of control. Rainy conditions are expected for the rest of the week. And it is dampering fire activity throughout the province, but it only takes a short period of hot, dry and windy conditions to bring the fire danger back up. Something evacuees worry about. When Edson got evacuated the second time, it uh, it pushed my anxiety a little bit more. What if that's going to happen to us when we return home? Marie Martin is living in a hotel in Fort McMurray and says the journey to get home isn't easy. It's because Fort Chip being isolated and the only way we, we can get out in the summer is either by plane by boat. Martin hopes when re-entry does happen, it'll be the first step for the community to move forward. I'm really hoping that this, this will start our healing for the whole community. Miriam Valdez Carletti, CTV News, Edmonton. The U.S. is hoping to heal its relationship with China. And that starts with a visit by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to Beijing, one that Canada's watching closely. China's relationship with North America is at a low point. There are concerns about the growing global influence of China under Xi Jinping. Here's CTV's Kevin Gallagher. For the first time in nearly five years, a U.S. diplomat is visiting China as Secretary of State Antony Blinken discussed growing disagreements with his Chinese counterpart. Intense competition requires sustained diplomacy to ensure that competition does not veer into confrontation. China says relations with the U.S. are at an all-time low. Blinken's trip was originally scheduled for February, but a Chinese spy balloon passing over Canada and the U.S. postponed the meeting. Since then, tensions have only grown worse. Earlier this month, a Chinese warship steered dangerously close to a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait. And last month, a Chinese fighter jet buzzed a U.S. plane. Blinken hopes to reset the strained relationship. Because they're feeling the heat, they understand that the American public uh, see China now as a, as a threat. China says the U.S. is trying to constrain its rapid rise and accuses Washington of meddling in its internal affairs, all while Beijing is facing allegations of interfering in Canada's democratic process. Canada's ambassador to China is advocating a restrained response. We need to focus on the areas where we have differences and, and difficulties with China, but we also need to maintain a dialogue and find ways to cooperate. While last month's expulsion of Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei shows Canada can take a tougher stance, the federal government insists it needs Beijing to combat climate change 
to maintain tens of billions of dollars in trade. We've got important economic relationships with, uh, with China. It is our second biggest trading partner. Both American and Canadian diplomats want to improve communication with China, even as the country becomes more aggressive, Morella, especially over Taiwan. Complicated relationship. Kevin Gallagher, thanks for that. A migrant boat disaster was narrowly averted today in the waters off Libya. About 100 migrants clapped their hands and sang in unison after their rescue from an overcrowded boat. These survivors are mainly from African countries. Now, only four days ago, a fishing trawler that left Libya sank off the coast of Greece. It feared more than 500 people drowned in what could be the deadliest migrant incident on record. A passenger ship caught fire off the coast of the Philippines, sending plumes of black smoke high into the air. All 120 passengers and crew members were rescued. The Coast Guards used a water cannon to put out the flames that raged for more than five hours. It's not clear what ignited that blaze. Five people were killed in four mass shootings this weekend in the U.S. in Missouri, Washington, California, and Illinois. The violence in San Diego and a Chicago suburb broke up Juneteenth celebrations. It was just chaos. There were sirens coming from, like, every direction. There was just hundreds of cop cars. More than 20 people were injured in the parking lot of this strip mall in Illinois. Now it's a holiday in the U.S. Juneteenth marks the end of slavery after the Civil War. A massive hovercraft is back out to sea, traveling to Nova Scotia after it became an unusual beachside attraction on the shores of New Hampshire. This decommissioned Canadian Coast Guard vessel is now privately owned. It made an unexpected landing on Hampton Beach. The crew found a meter-long gash in the rubber skirt Saturday, making it unsafe to operate. Repairs were made, and luckily, no one was hurt. While tens of thousands of Americans are dealing with sweltering heat stretching from Texas to Mississippi, severe storms are once again sweeping across Oklahoma. Here's one example of the damage seen so far. Gusty winds ripped off a roof of a community center. Hundreds of thousands are still without power tonight. And we're seeing new time-lapse video of a funnel cloud forming on Saturday in the western part of the state. While in Arkansas, a reported tornado ripped through this town, leaving a long stretch of destruction. So far, no injuries have been reported. And instead of sun and sand, parts of B.C. woke up to this, a dose of January. This is what it looked like, 75 kilometers west of Kelowna. Yes, that is snow. Environment Canada says the area could see a total of five centimeters over the next few days. Coming up, return of the Holy Father. Pope Francis back to work. Plus, the Canadian soccer star calling it quits. A smiling Pope Francis returned to his Sunday custom of greeting the public in St. Peter's Square. <laughs> the pontiff was released from hospital only two days ago. He underwent abdominal surgery to repair a hernia. Now, his doctors have asked the 86-year-old to take it easy during his recovery. And the pontiff remembered the young victims of the brutal school massacre in Uganda as families begin to bury their loved ones. 42 people, most of them students, were shot, burnt, or hacked to death by suspected Islamic militants from Congo. At least six students from the border town were kidnapped by the armed rebels. I want the security to tell us where they were when these killers came, uh, came to kill our people. This is the worst such attack the country has seen in over a decade. On the front lines in Ukraine, both sides are suffering heavy losses as Kyiv ramps up its counteroffensive against Russia. Ukrainian forces claim to have destroyed an ammunition depot near a Russian-occupied region in the south. And Moscow says it has repelled a series of Ukrainian attacks near the dam that collapsed two weeks ago. The flooding has killed at least 45 people. Food and medicine are now being airdropped to villagers 
as a humanitarian crisis looms. Iran's largest non-Muslim minority marked a grim anniversary today. Four decades ago, 10 women were imprisoned, tortured, and executed for refusing to renounce their faith. CTV's Craig Krause spoke with someone in Vancouver who lost both her mother and her sister that day. But the tragedy has fueled her fight for equal rights. Not a day goes by that Nahid Masloon doesn't think about her family. Our children never had the joy of having grandparents around. Her father executed by the Iranian regime for his Baha'i faith before coming for her mother and sister on June 18, 1983. They never had a lawyer to defend them. They never went to a court of law. It was the Islamic court, and the only option that they had, either recant your faith or face execution. Her mother and sister were two of the 10 women hanged in a public square in the southern city of Shiraz. The bodies never released to the families, as members of the minority religion continued to be killed. They chose death to uh, giving in to cruelty or to lie about what their fate was. When but you see their faces and, and read the stories, um, what goes through your head? Uh, it, is, uh, it is inspiring. I see light. A light Shora Mahatian has devoted her life to preserving and spreading to people around the world. Whether they were killed for their faith or they were in prison or they were denied schooling, uh, that resilience gave them the courage to move forward. Courage that the Baha'i are using to help those still facing persecution, such as property seized, places of worship banned, and access to education still restricted. You're fighting for the Baha'i, but also for women's rights. Their belief is that mankind is one, and that you know uh, we eventually will reach the point where there is going to be uh, no us on them. Sparking rallies around the world, including in Vancouver Saturday, as Iranian Canadians gathered to be a voice for the voiceless. <laughs> supporting those facing persecution and limited rights, something Masloon says is one step closer to fulfilling her family's dream for Iran. This is something that they would be really proud. Craig Crow, CTV News, Vancouver. Straight ahead, shattering a sky high glass ceiling. The high flying foray in a hot air balloon. It is a risky adventure, but that's why, if they succeed, they'll be in the record books. A couple in New Brunswick is preparing to fly across the Atlantic in a hot air balloon. They've hit a few delays trying to launch their high-flying plan, but they're not deterred. Here's CTV's Nick Moore. Their big trip hasn't begun yet, but Deborah and Mike's goals have already traveled far and maneuvered around many obstacles to get here. We're almost ready and very excited. The British couple are in Sussex, New Brunswick, ready to launch their transatlantic flight in a helium balloon. We've rigged the basket and it will be transported just as it is now, all ready to fly and taken to the launch site. Right now, they're waiting for a shift in the wind. The westerlies that are normal over the Atlantic haven't appeared. They're just beginning to appear more now, so it's, it's looking promising. Mike and Deborah are already well accustomed to dealing with unexpected delays. This trip was originally supposed to happen in 2019, but a global helium shortage grounded them. The pandemic in 2020 limited travel altogether, and then Mike was diagnosed with cancer. They've got through all of it. Here we are, catching up, and we look to fly. While also looking to make history. Debbie will be the first lady to captain a balloon across the Atlantic, and I'll be the first registered blind person to crew. The journey is a fundraiser for Blind Veterans UK. Mike is a former Royal Navy pilot. When I lost most of my sight at the end of 2007, I was able to get help, assistance, guidance, and so on. There's a lot of knowledge on the ground around Sussex when it comes to ballooning, thanks to the Atlantic Balloon Fiesta held in September. But it wasn't the only reason that Deborah and Mike wanted to start here. We live in Sussex uh, in England. West Sussex. Yep. And so we do have an East Sussex as well, don't we? Yep. But Sussex seemed appropriate. And while the couple have enjoyed their time in the area, they're ready to get in the air for a trip that could take around a week, depending on the weather. The wind might shift in a favorable direction later in the week. Nick Moore, CTV News, Sussex. 
And it's an end of an era for Canada soccer captain Atiba Hutchinson. He's hanging up his cleats for good. It has been an amazing 20 years of me playing football, uh, putting on the jersey, representing uh, our beautiful country. I think now is, is the perfect time for me, you know, to step away. Um, as I said, I've loved every moment of it. He closes this chapter of his career with a game in Las Vegas tonight where Canada took on the U.S. His coach calls him probably the greatest Canadian football player not many people know about. The 40-year-old made his debut back in 2003. After the break, the buzz from the Grand Prix. Because it's Verstappen in Canada for the second year in a row. Taking it to the max in Montreal. Max Verstappen roared ahead in the racing records at the Montreal Grand Prix. It is his 41st career win and the second year in a row he cruised to victory in Quebec. CTV's Matt Grillo is trackside. Max Verstappen led from the get-go. He never gave up his pole position despite having concerns about his tires. The tires are very tough. It was uh, really you know, cold out there. The tires are hard to get into the window. And um, yeah, we, uh, we did the best we could. I think the, the middle stint was probably a little bit tricky, but then at the end on the medium tires, it was a bit better. The battle for second played out over 70 laps between Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton. Alonso eventually got the edge. I, I knew Lewis, you know, he's never given up. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's, the, he's the worst driver you can have on your mirror because he will be always attacking you. Ferrari drivers came in fourth and fifth. And further down the standings was Canada's Lance Stroll. After appearing to struggle early, Stroll snuck into ninth. He says a higher placement was in the cards, but didn't work out. We also were unlucky with the first uh, safety car. We pitted like a lap before it came out. So I think like P6 looking at the race is definitely on the table. The rain held off for Sunday's race, but the weekend had its share of wet weather. And F1 fans have no problem with that. The performance of the car is less important on the wet surface. So we can see who's the best driver. F1 fan or not, Many say there's nothing like Grand Prix weekend. It's international, so we got it here in Montreal, in our country, in our backyard. The 52nd Canadian Grand Prix is in the books, and fans already have their sights set on next year. Matt Grillo, CTV News. And that's a wrap on this Father's Day. I'm Morella Fernandez. For Sandy Ronaldo and all of us here at CTV National News, thanks for your time. Omar Sajidina is here tomorrow. Good night. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.